Welcome back, everybody, to Open Line. I'm Cuthbert Langley here. We are talking children and mental health tonight. So if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. We've got some great specialists here who've been doing a great job answering a whole host of questions about a lot of topics tonight. Right now, we are joined with Lucy, who is on line one. Lucy, good evening. What's your question? Yeah, good evening. Uh, thanks for having this show because, you know, I just, I'm just overwhelmed sometimes when I listen to some of these young kids and it's it's just a different world it seems like in a lot of ways they have it better but in a lot of ways that they don't and you know I think we tell them how how much more intelligent they were than we were and I think we raise the expectations and I think a lot of times these kids seem stressed to, to meet those that we put on them but anyway I, my question is this I'm wondering if you ladies have ever ran into a case of what we used to call targeted child abuse. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have, have they got another name for it? You know, uh, because uh, uh, where you have like maybe one kid out of four or five kids that is being mentally or physically abused by a parent and the other members of the family kind of like go along with that abusive parent and then they make this kid feel like you know they're a problem or whatnot and then i have run into people that have been in situations like that and they come out of the family okay and they were like victimized but the rest of the family is kind of messed up I mean, how would you treat a situation like that? Have you ran into that? Oh, good question. Um, I had that experience when I was a very young physician mm. with a youngster who was beaten for not cleaning her plate. And uh, this was very tough. There were other children in the home who were not involved in this. And I think over the years, what I've come to see is that some often the child who is abused is somehow not as good a fit with the parents uh, personality as the other children I mean there is something about that relationship that's difficult um, and these would be youngsters who might not stay in the home um, I think they certainly would need treatment but uh, the initial a uh, move would be to keep the child safe, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, you, I guess you can see the effects of that continue on well beyond just early childhood and into adolescence as well. Well, I think you do, but some children are extremely resilient. Mm -hmm. They can come out of the toughest situations and succeed. Other children are more sensitive to the abuse and have a much harder time. Okay. Now we've touched on this a little bit, but is there a connection between mental health and physical health? And then kind of what role does that play, play in treatment and, and actually in diagnosis of it all? Well, there's certainly that connection. And I think the most obvious one for children is to look at youngsters who have diabetes or youngsters who have cancer. Uh, these are children who often get depressed and it's somehow those things run together, especially diabetes and depression. Mm -hmm. uh, children who have separation issues and don't want to go to school often have abdominal pain. Um, they can't eat in the morning, they're vomiting because the anxiety gives them physical symptoms. As we get into older age groups, we see tremendous issues that are uh, related to the mental illness, physical illnesses such as hypertension, obesity, diabetes, uh, stroke, mm -hmm. uh, heart attacks. Many of these patients have comorbid mental illnesses. Okay. Interesting. And what about, you know, when you get into you know, middle school and high school years, obviously self-image, body image are very important things to students. And again, with the social media, the, really the increase in all of that, do you see more cases of eating disorders and, and self-mutilation, those type of things? 
Well, you know, as Karen was talking about, I think that historically we've kind of had this perspective that our brain is cut off from the rest of our body, you know, but right. if you think about the worst day that you've ever had, you probably started to recognize it because of physical symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. And then if children don't necessarily know how to cope, what they do is try and find ways of coping with that. They may not be the most positive ways of coping. Even through adulthood, if we don't learn positive coping skills, how to take care of ourselves in a way that makes us better, sometimes we find ways to take care of ourselves in ways that don't make us much better. And what do you think the biggest problem, you know, the students you've talked to, what do you think the biggest problem, the biggest issue they're facing these days in terms Tough of mental health? I know, sorry, that was just a <laughs> self thought. I just threw it to you guys. It just dawned on me. But yeah, I mean, is there, you know, can you narrow it down to one or is there is just a whole host of I mean, in things. terms of prevalence across the age range, I would say that anxiety disorders as a very large kind of subset of things are definitely an issue. You know, Karen mm -hmm. touched on ADHD as well for, you know, adolescents and youngsters as you reference them. Oh. Um, but, you know, with situations that are stressful for us in our lifetimes, it causes that anxiety to rise. Some of that is good, but if we have chronic stress, we know what happens. You know, we physically wear down, we emotionally wear down, we mentally wear down. Absolutely. Well, Sarah's joining us right now. Good afternoon or good evening. I don't even know what time of day it is. Good evening, Sarah. This is Cuthbert. How are you doing? What's your question? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. My question is, um, my daughter was just, was just recently diagnosed as bipolar, and I was wondering if I should get a second opinion. Good question. So sometimes you get diagnoses and you don't really know uh, the expert tease behind the physician. I mean, how do you go about navigating that route? Um, how old is your daughter? She's 17. Um, she did have a trauma um, earlier in her adolescence that we were not aware of. And so um, just recently we started getting therapy for her, um, as a matter of fact, in January. And I finally asked the therapist if there was, like the, if she, if there was a diagnosis for her, whatever it was she was going through, and she said she was bipolar. And is she also seeing a psychiatrist or on any kind of mood stabilizer? She is on a, a mood stabilizer. She is seeing a trauma therapist. Okay. Well, I think if she, if she isn't doing well, um, then you have to rethink a little bit because it's a relatively challenging diagnosis, uh, particularly some of the milder forms the bipolar 2 disorder um, and in general I would think that a psychiatrist would be an appropriate person for your daughter to see in addition to the therapist. So it's it's tough what, what makes bipolar so tough to, to diagnose and then well because it? bipolar is a longitudinal illness at some points the mood would be too up and at other points it would be too depressed and in the middle it might at other times the mood might look normal so you really have to look at the the mood over time not just how you look now and that's very challenging especially in a 17 year old because if you're thinking about again going back to all of the life situations that might mm -hmm. be occurring for them plus the traumatic history you don't necessarily know if the mood is affected because of the situations or because of the genetic potential disorder at any point do you see gender playing a role when it comes to mental health diagnoses at all? Well we do. Uh, there are more boys who have attention deficit mm -hmm. disorder and more males who have autism spectrum disorder. Okay. Uh, there are generally more females tend to have depression and anxiety. Interesting. And is there a way, I mean, you know, at, at home as a parent, I mean, you know, if, if you think your child has bipolar, I mean, I guess you just therapy is the first step I and mean, what would be the first step if you think there might be something going on if you think your child has bipolar disorder they really probably need to be evaluated by a, by a psychiatrist uh, they would certainly benefit from therapy at the same time but this is an illness that can lead to hospitalizations and a number of complications and we really need uh, 
multiple approaches to treating that. And do you see that with a lot of different mental health diagnoses? I mean, you've got to go at it in so many different routes, you know, not only with medication, but with treatment. Uh, is it that kind of a long-term study for a lot of these different things? Well, I think, for instance, with schizophrenia, mm -hmm. it's certainly uh, something that requires consideration carefully of the diagnosis of what medications, what antipsychotic medications are available, and then what kinds of psychotherapy interventions could be the most helpful when people are very ill. And bipolar disorder tends to be a recurrent ongoing problem, but it can easily be confused in children and adolescents. Okay. So you really, we really don't want to call people bipolar who aren't. Okay. Seems like I, th definitely I think good. if you notice a major change in your child, you know, or something that's out of kind of the context of where you think they should be developmentally, as Karen had said earlier, it never hurts to get a mental health evaluation. You know, even if nothing is wrong, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just a phase, there, there's a mental health specialist across the board who can help. Absolutely. And we've talked about this briefly when we were discussing ADHD and, and medication and, and how effective the medication is, but also there's kind of a problem of, of over-prescribing out there to a certain extent. Well, I think there's been a problem with opiate medications, although generally psychiatrists do not prescribe those. Uh -huh. Um, there is always a debate about whether too many children and adolescents well, and adults are treated for ADHD. I think the best data still suggests that as a population they are undertreated and too few people have no treatment. Uh, if you look at mental illness in general, many, many people do not have access to mental health treatment, aren't aware that they need mental health treatment, or perhaps are resistant to okay. getting mental health treatment. And we were discussing this a bit ago about, you know, more so the social media effect, but talking about these mass shootings we're seeing, you know, these children that come from potentially well-to-do families, or, you know, you look at it, um, you know, with the Columbine shooting, you know, the parents really had absolutely no idea there were things going on behind doors right. that they had no idea about. I mean, what are signs? I mean, how do how can parents combat that? Because I'm sure that's got to be exceptionally difficult for a mother of an adolescent. And I think the older the the youngster is, the more difficult it is, mm -hmm. because in some states, such as Tennessee, 16 year olds have a lot of authority around whether they get treatment or not. So. I th I think the biggest thing is to look early on and try to ensure that your child is going along what would be considered roughly to be an average or normal trajectory in terms of school, in terms of friends, family relationships. We teach a class through Centerstone um, that's sponsored by the National Council for Behavioral Health and it's called Mental Health First Aid. And okay. what it kind of takes is that look at medical first aid and translates that to mental health issues, you know, to help kind of the general population get a good understanding at what we call noticing. Okay. So, you know, we notice when somebody is in distress when with a medical issue, oftentimes we don't necessarily know how to intervene, but that's why we take the course. Mental Health First state is very similar to that, where if we can become good noticers, hopefully it doesn't turn into the crises that we're talking about. That's a great point. And I guess, to your point, I mean, I really, I guess the social media, the way the media in general has talked about it, I mean, it seems like there's a bigger conversation going on than there used to be. I, I mean, th I think so. And then what's that role in the, I mean, that's got to be changing the effectiveness of everything. Well, I, I think it means noticing. that more people are encouraging people to seek mental health treatment. Um, it still isn't easy. Mm -hmm. I think this is why it's so... Tennessee has, I think, significant mental health resources, particularly in Middle Tennessee. So hopefully people who need to be treated in Middle Tennessee have access to all sorts of different interventions for mental health problems. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break, but if you have any questions for the rest of the night, give us a call at 615-737-7587. We'll be right back.